Some diseases can affect us in many ways, from mild discomfort to significant debilitating symptoms. How arthritis and its related conditions impact our lives. The doctors are on call tonight. Well, we don't know. Funding for On Call is provided in part by... Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call, starting its 11th year of opening doors for important medical information. And by... The South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding provided by Dakota Care, Regional Health, the Brookings Health System, Dr. Mark Bubach with Dakota Allergy and Asthma, the South Dakota American College of Physicians, and Swiftel Communications. Closed captioning for On Call is provided by the generous support of Avera, the Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation. Hello and welcome to On Call Television. Tonight we delve into the world of arthritis and all things related to the field of rheumatology. This specialty deals with illnesses of the human body mostly resulting from a misdirected immune system and the inflammatory response. It's a field which is radically and rapidly changing every day. All of you at home are also participants in our discussion tonight. We are pleased that you are watching and know that you will take away valuable health information regarding arthritis, the warning signs, what it means to your daily life. Please call in your questions to 1-888-376-6225. You may also email them to questions at oncalltelevision.com. You make us better. It's your show. Call us. Give us your questions. Here to help us better understand arthritis and its other conditions is our good friend, Dr. Jim Engelbrecht, a rheumatology internist trained first at the University of Iowa College of Medicine and then chief resident followed by rheumatology training at the University of Utah. Jim now practices rheumatology at the Regional Medicine Medical Clinic and Hospital in Rapid City. Welcome, Jim. Thanks, Rick. So let's talk about uh, the types of arthritis uh, there are. I mean, you know, we, we know a little bit about rheumatoid arthritis. Most of us have a little osteoarthritis. What, how can you separate these things? You know, I think that the, the best way to separate them is to think in terms of the immune system. The, um, the immune system in what we call autoimmune diseases <clears throat> becomes our enemy. You know, usually right. our immune system is our friend that helps protect us. In autoimmune diseases, it becomes the enemy. And so, in rheumatology, we have uh, the diseases where the immune system uh, is, is turned on by something uh, and it, it recognizes self as being foreign, foreign and then attacks it. And so we call it auto self immune diseases. And so you have the rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, ankylosing spondylitis, dermatomyositis, polymyositis, all of those itises, okay, yeah. all those conditions, that's the immune system. Then you have, um, sort of the wear and tear where the cartilage kind of wears down and you start to get some bone spurs and that's the more typical osteoarthritis. It's not the immunologic disease that the autoimmune is. It doesn't just attack the whole system. It really focuses on the joints. And then over kind of on the side we have some of the metabolic things like some of the calcium problems and then we have some of the uric acid problems that lead to gout and, and some of those metabolic things. And that's a little bit of a different category over there. And then some of the other things we deal with, of course, is oste osteoporosis, and that's just the bone changes. So that's kind of the playing field that I operate in most Okay, days. so the immune system diseases, the, the, the uh, osteoarthritis, and then these crystals and metabolic, metabolic stuff, things. Right, yeah. So, uh, and what do you see the most? Well, if what I see the most is rheumatologists would be the autoimmune diseases. Right. But what's out there the most are the osteoarthritis, okay? Probably, as you mentioned, you know, we're all getting a little older and so we're wearing and tearing a little bit more yeah. on things. But 
you know, probably as much as maybe uh, 14, 15 to 20 percent of the population eventually will get some form of osteoarthritis, and that's the sore knee or the sore hip or the sore shoulder or whatever. Um, much smaller numbers in terms of uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis may be one and a half, two percent of the population, whereas osteoarthritis, 14 or 15 percent of the population. But as a rheumatologist, most of the osteoarthritis can be taken care of. Your primary care physician or somebody right. can help you with that. The, where we get into these serious, potentially crippling and life-threatening diseases with the autoimmune diseases, that's where you need some a little extra expertise once in a while from rheumatology. The paradox is that you've got now fabulous weapons to fight these immune system diseases, and I'm trying to help this person with degenerative osteoarthritis, yeah. and it's, I don't have it's, very it's, good. Uh, you know, and there's a lot, you know, the, the, the bad news is there's not a lot out there for osteoarthritis that's new. The good news is there's a lot of research going on, and they are looking for what, what would be the equivalent of a disease-modifying drug for osteoarthritis. They're not there yet, but, but uh, probably over the next few years, you're going to start to see some, some things. But you're right. You're left with these anti-inflammatory medicines that have been around for decades now. Uh, nothing new there going on. You've got some analgesic medications. You've got Tyl the Tylenol. You've got uh, uh, you know rest. Therapy. You've got splinting. You've got physical therapy. But again, you know, I'll tell you something um, that I find uh, that sometimes gets overlooked. If you have somebody that has a family history of osteoarthritis, okay, so yeah. you had, you know, a, a, a parent or a grandparent that had a hip replaced or a knee replaced, so you know that's in there in the family a little yeah. bit. They got some knobbies on the end of their fingers and stuff right. like that. And you're relatively young, you know, 40s, 50s, and middle age group. Um, you need to do some things then that can maybe forestall those kinds of things. And, well, and yes. So what so is it? What is it? Okay. Well, you'll be happy to know that exercise is very important. Hey! <laughs> I, I mean, I knew that would shock you, okay? <laughs> but uh, exercise is very important. Uh, and again, the right kind of exercise. Yeah. So when I talk to people that, that are in their 40s and 50s and I see early osteoarthritis, I say, you know, the time has now come to, to stop the impact exercising, okay? The, 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 the racquetball, the tennis, the banging, the joints, the impact kinds of things, and substitute for more fluid things, the swimming and the bicycling and the walking and maybe some easy jogging and some good shoes and those kinds of things, okay? That's the exercise thing. And then that, of course, leads to improved weight control, and we know that obesity enhances osteoarthritis everywhere, not just in the, not you'd think, well, the gravity and it's going to wear my knees out, but it also wears your fingers out, so go figure. Obesity is bad for your joints no matter where your joints are, uh, which joints you're talking about. So that's a big thing. I think that taking care of your bones, making sure you have good bone health, calcium, vitamin D, those kinds of things are, are very important. You'll hear about supplements. There's been, you know, glucosamine and chondroitin. My God, it's been around since 1969, okay? You'd think we'd know the answer to that. And we don't really know the answer, but what I tell people is uh, there's, it's, it's not going to hurt you to try a little bit of glucosamine. And uh, what you have to understand is that about 25% of people will have some kind of response to it and 75% of people won't respond to it. And if you put yourself on a couple thousand milligrams a day of glucosamine and some chondroitin with it and you do it and you mark the calendar for three months, at the end of three months you say, gee, that feels a lot better, maybe you're a responder. 25% will have a response. Yeah. It's worth 75% won't. And if you don't respond to it, put it away. You're just throwing your money away. Yeah. Okay. Right. So that's osteoarthritis, and that's about all we've got there. The other thing you're talking about is all these huge changes we've had in, in the in immunologic this. side. In, in the, but there is an inflammatory osteoarthritis I want to ask you about. There are people who I see who get hot joints, yeah. and out of the blue. I have a, yeah. a friend who, who uh, has breakfast with me at, at uh, the same place where I do my writing, and he came in, and suddenly he just was... Uh, and his, uh, he was really quite debilitated for about a month. And I checked his sed rate, I checked his uric acid level, I checked everything, they were all normal. And, and you know, th those are the situations that you don't want to misdiagnose as having rheumatoid or something just because they're inflamed. Okay? Yeah. And that's the big problem there. Sometimes they can look like rheumatoid, sometimes they can look like they're really, you know, because they are inflamed, yeah. all right? And, and what happens in a, in a small percentage, maybe five or 10% of people with osteoarthritis, is that they get these little bone spurs that then get little calcifications around them and then those bone spurs will sometimes loosen up and they'll work themselves into the joint and all of a sudden you get some calcium stuff that gets loose in there and it's just like putting sand in there and it provokes this 
Acute pain. Acute pain. That's the reaction. pseudo gout. Okay. Is that, is well, that, that pseudo gout? That's pseudo gout, but there's also, you know, pseudo gout kind of applies to certain types of inflammatory osteoarthritis, but there are just, just plain old inflammatory osteoarthritis. Fortunately, a small number, but you really have to use intensive anti-inflammatories to keep those under control All right. and not misdiagnose them. That's the key. See, don't call it rheumatoid Don't arthritis. call it rheumatoid because you're going to put them on all the wrong stuff. Right. So do you treat them acutely with a little bit of prednisone or a little oh, bit you, of something? Sometimes you use a little bit of prednisone. Sometimes I just use a good solid dose of an anti-inflammatory if they've got a cast iron gut. No, I mean, if they can handle it. Yeah. The, if they, if, if they <laughs> have... That's the problem. No, if they don't have yeah, it's, it's, it's how you do it. You know, you've got to do it the right way. If you teach people how to take these medicines the right way, they can take a pretty high dose of anti-inflammatory and get that inflammation down and then maintain it on lower doses. The right way is? The right way is to... T is to First of all, take the right dose, the prescribed dose, so that your doc gives you the right dose. Not just give yourself a bunch of them. You know, people come in with all this exotic, I took how many dozen ibuprofen in the last two, you know, you gotta be smart about it. Make sure that you got the right medicine, that, that, uh, that you take it long enough and at a high enough dose, because it's got to build up, it's got to get into your system, it's gotta get into these joints, that's where it works. It doesn't work here, it works here. And it takes a little while. Takes a time. And right. you take it with food. A reasonable dose would be 600 of ibuprofen three times a day. Yeah, or even four times. Or four times a day. With as food. long as you protect yourself, yeah. Protect yourself. Eat, take the medicine, you know. That's and if you start getting a sore gut, stop it. And no Absolutely. Full, and Absolutely. long term, my nephrology friend will tell you, it can be hard on your kidneys. Well, sure, but we're not talking long term here. All we want to do is get you out of trouble and get you back to work, okay? And then we'll figure out something long term. Okay. Sioux Falls caller, this person has Crohn's disease and has lots of pain in the joints. Does Crohn's disease bring about arthritis, and how do you treat that kind of pain? Yeah, Crohn's disease is, infl is yeah, let's inflammatory that. bowel disease, okay? And if you look at the inflammatory bowel diseases, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease being sort of the prototypical ones, uh, there is an arthritis that's associated with those diseases, and it may or may not be present. There are people, in fact, the majority of people can have inflammatory bowel disease and never have the, the joint inflammation, right. maybe, maybe 60, 70 percent of them, okay? But the other 25 or 30 percent can have an associated arthritis, and it can be a peripheral joint arthritis, so it can be like out in the hands and the wrists and the knees. Like rheumatoid. Like rheumatoid, like rheumatoid kind of, um, or it can be in the back. And it could be spondylitis. There's a, there's a form that could be. So if somebody has the diagnosis of inflammatory bowel disease and they are having significant joint pain, either in their back that's new or in their peripheral joints or they're getting a swollen knee or a swollen ankle or something like that, there's a good chance that could be what we call enteropathic arthritis. In other words, entero gut pathic arthritis. Right. And that's what we label the arthritis that's associated with uh, inflammatory bowel disease. And um, the question is, well, if I treat the inflammatory bowel disease, will the arthritis get better? Sometimes it will and sometimes it won't. I have a number of patients that I work with the gastroenterologist on. They've got the gut under control, but they can't get the, the, the joints under control. And so they ask me to come in and help work on the joints. And, and that's a good partnership. When we do there, that. There's, is it writer's syndrome that has either a urethritis or a diarrhea or g gut problem? Is that part of this yeah, whole story? Well, that's, that's what we call, we now call that uh, reactive arthritis, okay? And, and uh, writers, when, when you and I were in medical school, and it's R-E-I-T-E-R, right. apostrophe S, writer's um, syndrome, was a, a, a response that some people got to a bacterial ex exposure, which right. often cause urinary tract infections. Yeah. And, and so what would happen was the people would get the urinary tract infection, have those symptoms, and then they would have a reaction in their system that gave them eye inflammation and arthritis. And so that was the classic triad, urethritis, iritis, and arthritis. That was the classic Rider syndrome. That's been all now sort of uh, put out there in this reactive arthritis realm because there's a lot more bacteria we recognize that can cause these problems. And so it's a little different than enteropathic. So you get the bacterial infection, you have an inflammatory response as a result of that. You know, it's, I'll tell you the, the analogy that, you, that, that uh, some of the people listening might, might uh, appreciate. Uh, think about acute rheumatic fever. Okay, right. acute rheumatic fever is you get a strep infection and certain people when they have a strep infection as they're getting better, all of a sudden they get an arthritis and they can get a skin rash and they can get the, the car, all that stuff. And what's happening there is that that's the body reacting to that strep infection and throwing these antibodies all over and these antibodies are starting to plug into a lot of stuff, okay? That's what reactive is. Wow.
well, we're going to take this for just a minute. There is seldom an episode of On Call that is broadcast that doesn't have me somewhere in the discussion telling you at all at home or go out and exercise. <coughs> Excuse me. And you should, so don't stop. But sometimes when we push ourselves physically, we can injure or irritate our body. Plantar fasciitis is one of the possible conditions we may have to deal with. I like to call this the what and the why, okay? The what, what is it? Well, plantar fasciitis, that's what it is. How do you get rid of plantar fasciitis? Well, ice the heck out of it. I need you to stretch, but the why. Why do you have this? This is a biomechanical thing, all right? You're right, shoes are gonna help you because if it can help, I think it all start. I think this is your root cause. If we can help control your mechanics here, you're not going to change how your foot runs and you're not going to affect that a little bit more. So, you know, your best friend is ice. You've got to ice this as much as possible. Okay. If you iced it every hour, you would not be overdosing on the ice. Okay. You've got to ice like as much as you can, whenever you can, as okay. often as you can. That's like everything. So you know what's great? Get a freeze. bottle of water, freeze it, put it on the floor and roll over it. So. Now, with the pain being right in the heel, should I be yeah. Yeah, right to there, all into the here. way? Okay. I would say right in through here. So, okay. keep it moving. Two minutes, you won't frostbite yourself. And then you already know your stretch. Mm -hmm. Put your leg up here. You can grab a hold of your toes. Use your hand on this side. Grab a hold of those toes. Ex uh, stretch that plantar fascia a little bit. This is your second buddy in the morning. So before I get out of bed. Yeah, you know, do this one. Good. Get, grab those toes, extend the toes, get the plantar fascia stretched out. You know, any type of boot you put on a person can be restricting. Um, some people don't like them because it's warm. Uh, you know, I've been treating runners for a long time. Personally, I like this one because of the toe action. If I can get your toes to extend a little bit, I can get that plantar fascia to stay on stretch as you sleep. If you're sleeping and it's healing in this position, stretched out, when you stand on it, you won't tear. So usually I recommend you just put your foot on the floor and just take up the slack, you know. Okay. So it should be it from there. So I would say just something like that. The whole idea is that you don't crank it because if you crank it up and you can't sleep in the night or you subconsciously take it out when you sleep, then it doesn't do us any good. But that just gives a little bit of a, a little bit of stretch for that. So if you're gonna spend the money, spend on a good quality shoe. We got to find a shoe that allows you to that rocker motion. So it's less torque here, more rocker here. Mm -hmm. If your shoe is too soft, like a minimalist shoe, and you have, you know, you have to try to do this more, kind of pound it out more, mm -hmm. you're rolling this way more. Mm -hmm. Heat the joint, stretch mm -hmm. the joint, ice the plantar fasciitis. Well, you know, I've got a rheumatologist right here. This is your opportunity. Call in your questions. I mean. For free. I mean, you're, you would do it for, hey, that, that's a good price. Call 1-888-376-6225. Call in your questions or you could email them at questions at oncalltelevision.com. Give us your questions, please. Well, we do have a question about psoriatic arthritis from Sioux Falls. Do you want to talk about the, the plantar fasciitis? Well, let's, yeah, let's talk about the plantar fasciitis. Yeah, just to right. kind of add on to what... Yeah, they were just so watching. What was he saying? He was you saying know, the, she's the, got plantar fasciitis. Right. What is that? And, well, it's just inflammation in the in the connective tissue on the bottom part of the foot, and it separates the different layers there. And the, the idea is to stretch that out. Stretching is a key part of that. Okay, so the the different devices there that's just to basically hold you different positions in one thing and do the stretching and the icing and that kind of thing. But there are some now some topical preparations, some topical anti-inflammatory drugs that you can put on your skin now and that are absorbed there locally that are really good for someone like a sore, like a, like a bunion that's sore, or like plantar fasciitis. Sometimes you can inject the things that can be a little bit more aggressive, but you know, there are some ways to get at that, but you, you just, you need to change the position of your foot. And I, I don't want to, no, you know, no, we want to answer questions, but I, but I thought we should just, you know, put the, the final chapter so, on that one. Uh, is there a topical, a non-steroidal over the counter? Uh, no. No, I so, think they're all prescription. And okay, so you I ask want, your doctor, what, ibuprofen top? Well, they're, I think they're both, they're, they're diclofenac is the generic, they're diclofenac um, preparations, okay? And, you know, there are prescription ones, they're a little bit pricey, but, you know, I mean, when you got sore feet. It's worth it. It's sometimes it's worth it, and you're not, it, you, you have very, very limited exposure systemically. I mean, you'd have to absorb a ton of this stuff, so it's not like taking it by mouth like you were, 
right. alluding to with the GI problems. So you would rub right where it hurts. Right where it hurts. You put it in there a couple times a day or whatever. Okay. There's some that's a drop that you can put the drops in there. Okay. It's, you know, worth checking works. out. Yeah. Oh, all right. Uh, well, we have a question about psoriatic arthritis. Great, great, great topic. Okay. <clears throat> I mean, psoriasis, I see it all, all the time. It's yeah. this weird buildup of skin. It's a, an autoimmune disease where your body kicks in and your skin is just piling on itself. Right. We think it's autoimmune. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, I, and I, you know, I think the evidence is that it's an autoimmune disease. And so, <clears throat> therefore, it makes sense that there'd be some cast-off autoimmune problems. And it's the cast-off problems or the arthritis that go with it. And it turns out there's about... Um, if you start splitting them into different groups, there's probably about five different kinds of psoriatic arthritis. So it's very important, number one, that we have the correct diagnosis of psoriasis, okay, because some things can look like psoriasis that aren't psoriasis. And so if there's any question about that, I really ask my dermatology colleagues to weigh in and tell me this is, this is really psoriasis. And then if it is, then it's up to me to kind of figure out what is this? Is this like you got psoriasis and you have rheumatoid, a couple of not too uncommon things and just end up in one person, or is this something distinctive with the psoriasis as an autoimmune disease that's giving us this arthritis? So, so, uh, so the, if you've got, I mean, is there ever psoriatic arthritis and you don't find the psoriasis? You know, that can happen, but, it's, but it, it is, um, you know, usually if there's some psoriasis around, even a kind of little tiny, you know, they have what they call guttate lesions. It looks that, like a it, drop. There's a drop of it, you know. You can, you can usually find it someplace. If it's, if it's significant, you know, enough to produce the arthritis, it's probably going to find it someplace. But the people who have the worst psoriasis don't commonly have the, the arthritis. They may or may not have it. I've seen some of the worst plaque psoriasis you ever want to see. They don't have, they have absolutely normal joints. And I've seen have people who have just have a smattering of little guttate lesions here and there, and they just got terrible arthritis. Okay, yeah. so, I mean, it's, there, there's no... Rules. So, what do you treat them with? I mean, uh, methotrexate or? Do yeah, you, you know, uh, methotrexate's been around for a long time for psoriasis. In fact, <coughs> methotrexate for psoriasis preceded methotrexate for rheumatoid arthritis, right. and it was the fact that, you know, the, I mean, methotrexate story is very interesting, starting with treating leukemia and how it came through all the different steps, and we don't need to go into all that today, but um, the, the um, uh, methotrexate is probably very helpful. There's a sulfur drug called sulfasalazine. Sometimes it's helpful with some cases. That, those drugs usually set the stage, and then if you don't have the control, then you can start talking about the, the what we call the anti-TNF or the biologic medicines, which you see advertised on TV. You know, Phil Mickelson, yep. the, the golfer, right, does right. the commercial. He has psoriatic arthritis, and yeah. you know, is on uh, you know one of the one of the biologic medicines. So okay, tissue necrosis factor TNF, anti-TNF. Yeah. Yeah. Explain that. Well, you, for, first of all, uh, forget tissue necrosis factor, okay, because that. Uh, it's not tissue, it's tumor necrosis factor. Forget tumor necrosis factor, okay? It just, it just confuses you. Just call it TNF. It, it, what that is, it's, it's one of the many factors that helps drive the immune reaction, the inflammatory reaction. It's one of the key players in that. And when it was being discovered year, decades ago, yeah. okay, it was discovered in the context of some, some neoplastic things, and, that, and it got the name tumor necrosis factor, okay? But it, it is, it, it really is just, you call it TNF and don't think of anything about tumors or anything like that. It's just, it's, it's a facilitator, a mediator of inflammation and immune reaction. And what anti-TNF drugs do then, you've got this key cog in the, in the middle of this immune response and the right. TNF drug. Gloms it up. Stops the cog from going and it can't, and it can't go anymore. Oh, wow. and, and then down, the, the whole thing stops on the other, on the other side. I have heard that, uh, that the inflammatory response is sometimes enhances cancer growth, and turning off this, the, can, the cancer or the inflammatory response in certain ways helps control cancer in certain way, times. Do you know anything about that? Um, you know, some of the can, new cancer th therapies. Yeah, that. yeah. You know, and, and if you look at some of the new cancer th therapies, you know, you'll see they end in MAB, monoclonal yeah. antibody, and they're they're involved in that right. in that process, but. You know, I'd, I'm not uh, an authority on that, and okay. I, 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 I don't want to give you any wrong information. I know how it works in rheumatology. Yeah. But oncology is a different deal. Yeah, so. it is a different deal. I, I, I'm not authority either, but when I was looking about inflammation That's right. this week, I was thinking about it. Explain uh, celiac causing rheumatoid arthritis. What about okay. celiac Cel disease? Gluten neuropathy. Yes. Uh, gluten. What is celiac? Uh, well, celiac disease. You're just you're they're sensitive to gluten. It's an and immune. And, and and it's well. And the thing is that there are all 
levels and lo all gradations of sensitivity to, to this, okay? You could have, it's, you could be very mildly sensitive and you would never notice anything, okay? And you could be severely developed and you can develop it, okay? You can develop it as, you don't, you're not necessarily born with it, you develop it. And um, you can get some profound reactions to, to gluten that will give you all the stigmata of, of autoimmune disease. Um, I've seen an, uh, these are exceptions, not the rule. So I'm going to tell you the exception okay. cases. Okay, yeah. I've seen some of the most profound-looking autoimmune diseases that look that you would you would say in a million years this is classic widespread scleroderma, and all we did is take the gluten out and it all went away. Okay, now that's the exception. Uh, that's not an excuse for everybody that's got rheumatic disease, or, you know, any kind of autoimmune disease to stop gluten. But sometimes it doesn't add up and you can't figure it out and you go, wait a minute, you know, do, are they having any bowel symptoms? No, not really or whatever. But there's some blood tests you can start doing. You can start to look for that, for the gluten sensitivity. So uh, it's an important thing, but it's not the cure-all. That's the thing, okay? All right. I do know that there are people who, who don't have the blood, positive blood test for celiac disease, cut out gluten and their guts better, they feel hey, better. listen, who's to argue with that? Who needs gluten? Yeah. You know? I mean, <laughs> well, look at all the gluten. I mean, sure, yeah, you'd like to, you know, you like a piece of bread and stuff like that, but you have, you, you're not going to, you know, you can, you can live without having a piece of bread, for yeah. sake. Yeah. You know, and all the, the new gluten stuff, all the stuff from rice and yeah. all the different things. Shoot, you know, I mean, if you, if gluten's making you sick, stop the gluten, get it out of there. Try it, try something different. Yeah. All right, now we've got a bunch of questions. Let's just roll a little bit. Should okay. one big, one take ibuprofen or Tylenol for joint pain when they have diabetes and they take blood thinners? Aha, Aha. good question. You know, the, the um, it, almost always you'll be safer taking the Tylenol than anything else if you're in, in that situation. Number one, the NSAID anti-inflammatory meds like naproxen and ibuprofen and the one, you know, the over-the-counter and some Believe of these ones, they and have a little and higher and risk of, of problems when you've got diabetes, okay? So you got, you know, that's, a, that's kind of a red flag when we're gonna do that. If you're on blood thinner, uh, you shouldn't take any non-steroidal anti-inflammatory except there is one that's available branded that, you, that doesn't affect the platelets that you could use if you absolutely had to have that. Which is? Um, which is Celebrex. Okay. And, um, but there again, we try to get by with Tylenol if we can in if people can. who are anticoagulated. Right, but no more than six extra strength or nine regular Tylenol a day. Okay, I tell people, you know, if you stay on the, on the, on the at 3,000 or less total dose, you'll, you'll never have a problem with it. I mean, it's, if you're otherwise healthy, if you don't right. have kidney problems. Because the, the, the thing to remember about Tylenol is Tylenol, if you said unsafe, safe on my graph here, Okay, Tylenol, safe, 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 safe. You get to 4,000 milligrams, unsafe. Yeah. Okay, it's not like this. It's, it's like, boom. Yeah, and so if you stay at, at 3,000 here, you're never gonna get to this. All right, scleroderma related to arthritis. Caller had a family member who recently died of scleroderma. Yes. What is scleroderma? Well, we talked you. about it earlier. Yeah, you know, scleroderma is, um, it's, the, it's a disease that that I least like to talk about. And the reason for that is because we really don't have a treatment for that one. Okay, we have come so far in lupus and rheumatoid and all these meds. And if you look at scleroderma, we're not much farther along than we were 30 years ago, which does, wasn't very far. Does that okay? because we don't know what we got there? Well, it's, it is a very different kind of autoimmune disease because it, 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 it tends to stimulate fibrous tissue formation which tends to get really hard and scar down and affect the circulation and, and then the joints can't work right and then it can cause inflammation in the muscles because of that and then it can get into the lungs and it can get into the kidneys and it drives the blood pressure up and we have stroke problems. I mean it just, it's, and, and what we try to do is to get to it as quickly as we can so that we can do some things to control some of those problems that we can like the blood pressure, okay. we can. If, if we can control the blood pressure, we can stop all the bad things from the high blood pressure from happening. But if can we, we stop that progressive scarring? Well, it, it, you know, uh, I have to said. tell you, we can't, okay? Uh, you know, the, the bad news is we cannot stop it. When it has, when it's going gangbusters, you can't stop it, okay? The good news is that most people don't go gangbusters, and so there's different gradations, and we can come in with different things along the way. And there are some hopeful things out there that people are working on right now. So. All is not lost. I mean, that'll, it'll change. Okay. All right. Rheumatoid arthritis is a life-changing disease. It obviously affects 
your ability to move as you would like and do the activities you enjoy, but it also can alter your mood and your outlook in life. On Call talked with a rheumatoid arthritis sufferer to see her life experience. I first discovered or was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis when I was 34 years old. Uh, I was in kind of a stressful situation. I had gotten a divorce. I was the head teacher in a middle school uh, in my department. Uh, my father died that year and I became uh, president of our family uh, operation that same time. And I'm not sure just what it was, but I think it was the combination of all those factors that really made me aware that something was wrong. Uh, before that time, I'd had some symptoms uh, when I would do stressful things with my hands. My hands would get very sore and swell, but I didn't really recognize it as um, rheumatoid arthritis. But after that year, I went to the doctor and sure enough, he did some blood tests and called me at school and said, I have good news and bad news. The good news, it's not cancer. The bad news, it's rheumatoid arthritis. And so from then on, I had made the kind of the attitude that I was going to whip this disease. Well, you can't whip it, but I can, I'm living proof that you can live with it. I think every joint in my body has had a flare at some time or another. And when I first was diagnosed, it seemed like either the pain was a lot worse or I didn't have the tolerance for pain that I have now. Painful swollen joints are probably the biggest thing you have to deal with. The second thing is the fatigue that seems to accompany it. And I think anytime you have pain, you have fatigue. And so um, combating being tired a lot and then not being able to sleep well at night. Um, rheumatoid arthritis has a way of um, being really nasty at night. You're not able to turn over easily or your wrist will swell and get inflamed and it hurts beyond well so you can't sleep or some other joint will do that. Methotrexate I've been on now for probably 15 or more years and it's just been a wonder drug for me. I just recently had to replace my stove or my refrigerator and oven and I really looked at the styles that would be easy for me uh, to use. Uh, I have a wall oven that's at the right height so that I can take things in and out easily. It has a pull-out shelf that's on rollers which makes it slide very well. Uh, the refrigerator, I got one with a bottom freezer and the French doors on top which makes it easy to get things. You don't have to be stooping all the time. Uh, things that everybody likes, but when you have uh, painful joints sometimes it's even easier that way. Living with our rheumatoid arthritis is kind of a trial and error situation. Uh, you try it and if it doesn't work you back off. So we don't want to be a pest to our doctors, but at the same time if we expect help we need to keep them informed. You are really your own best health care advocate. And so staying abreast with what your treatment is and listening to your doctors, following their instructions. And then there are two other people I'd like to add to your healthcare team. And one of those uh, is your physical therapist. I had ignored an injured knee for a year. We gave it cortisone shots, but I didn't realize that I was getting very weak in my, with one knee until the new rheumatologist said, you know, you need to look at physical therapy. So I've been doing that for a month now, and it's really, I think, helping. Probably one of the most important people on your health care team is somebody I haven't yet mentioned yet, and that is your husband or spouse and your family. And um, when they understand that uh, you're hurting today, then they pitch in and help or don't have high, as high expectations. And it's really good to know that you have a family that cares and that works with you most important things in living with rheumatoid arthritis is feeling like that you're in control and you when you feel like you're in control there's not that helplessness that can lead to depression or um, that woe is me I can't do anything because you can do things thanks so much for that uh, story that's a lovely lovely lady who's controlled her her uh, rheumatoid arthritis 
I read uh, at the last uh, ACP meeting that 60% of the people with rheumatoid arthritis can be controlled with methyltrexate alone, which costs? It's, it's a few bucks a month. It's, it's really, I mean, everybody, um, I think the standard is still um, for, the, for the average rheumatoid patient to start with methotrexate. When you're going to go, when you, when you have to move into something a little bit more aggressive, start with methotrexate. Now, there, you know, from a rheumatology perspective, there could be exceptions to that rule. There are th certain things that I can look at in terms of blood tests and clinically and stuff like that are going on that I can predict this is somebody who's not going to respond very well and I need to be more aggressive. But methotrexate is the place to start. Right. And then you, when do you move to the biologics? The, that, well, those you know, are the, how much you know, a month? We, we do what's called, we, we're doing more and more of what's called treat to target. And we can come up with a score now for your rheumatoid disease. When I see you for the first time based on your joint count, how many tender and swollen joints you have, what your sed rate is, this kind of thing. And, and I know that I want you at a certain score. And so if I've got you on methotrexate and whatever and we're not getting there, it's time to do something else. All right, we don't mess around. If we see erosive disease, any damage to the joints, time to move. get going. And yep. you move these biologics are quite expensive. Yeah, they are. But they're important. Okay, we've got a ton of questions. Thank you for those calls. Thank you. Uh, what are the benefits of tramadol for osteoarthritis? Your doctor wants to exchange Mobic for tramadol. Tramadol is, is, is not a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. In other words, it's not an anti-inflammatory like ibuprofen or like or something. It is, it is a milder narcotic, I suppose you would, you would say. Uh, it can be used with Tylenol, for example. That's a good, good combination. It's reasonably safe if you keep the dose down, okay? I mean, if you start take, getting wild with it, six, seven, eight tablets a day, you you're, can get into all kinds of problems with it, just like this. Right. So it's a good adjunct to what you're doing. And it and works better than narcotics alone because it has a sort of a, a certain additional kicker in the brain. Yep. Yeah. Here's uh, Rapid City. Shoulder hurts at bed at night. Can't sleep. Full range of motion during the day. Does limit her during uh, full range of motion during the day. Does limit her during the night. So the question so, is shoulder. So, uh, well, shoulder issues are always complicated. Okay, and I and you know we deal with shoulder problems that are inflammatory in nature. I really rely a lot on working with my orthopedic colleagues on shoulder things because they're all you know if they've got rotator cuff tears or whatever we need, but. Somebody who, in this particular case, somebody that is pretty good during the day and they can move around do everything, and then as they <coughs> lie down at night, all of a sudden when they move, their shoulder hurts. Generally, that implies that there's some inflammation on that shoulder. Okay, so there's something inflammatory going on because what happens when you're lying still, it, the the fluid in there gels, and then when you turn over, it start, it, it's it's got to kind of break that gel loose, and then oh, you, oh, and then it hurts, and then you're going through that whole thing. So, you know, then you start to worry about is there more, do you need to be on anti-inflammatory? Uh, could this be a result of another injury? Now I'm getting some inflammation there, but it really needs to be look at, you know, you need to find people that are good at looking at shoulders. Rheumatologists are good at looking at shoulders. Orthopedic surgeons are good at looking at shoulders. Um, if somebody's not comfortable looking at shoulders, you can waste a lot of time and money and not find anything. And so, right, and injections can help sometimes. Sometimes, yeah. But but, but uh, one of the things that I thought about this week was that if you keep your muscles in good shape, you don't let them get weak, particularly your upper body, then it keeps the ball in the socket, and then it doesn't fall out and get osteoarthritis. What's that? In the best of all worlds, that's true. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Who's going to pay attention to that, though? Okay, I mean, people got to work for a living. People got to shingle houses and build houses and use their arms, and they're doing stuff and and, and working around and doing things. And and we get a little, you know, as we get older, we're a little bit more vulnerable. You got to do some things to protect yourself. But again, the better shape you keep yourself in, the better shape you keep yourself in. Okay, are there arthritis medicines that one can take when you're in atrial fib? which is an um, irregular rhythm that for which many yeah, well, people are on blood thinners. Right, and that's the key. If you've got atrial fib and you're on blood thinner, then that really limits what you can take as far as the, the medications. And, and I, as a you know, have I done it? Yeah, but I don't like to do regular anti-inflammatories on people like that. I would use Celebrex if I wanted, you okay. know, because it doesn't affect the Celebrex. platelets, or I use Tylenol. How do you determine, this from Huron, how do you determine the type of arthritis you have? It's, it's really a combination of things, but it really starts with what you and I are doing right now. It's talking to somebody, okay? You've got to get that history. You've got to ask them all the questions. I mean, I, by the time I'm done talking to somebody, I'm about 90% through my workup. I've got it almost figured out. Now I just got to look at the joints and do a few things. And then the blood and the x-ray and some of those things, they just kind of confirm. And so I can be very selective. I don't have to do 
big panels you mean and it's not the MRIs? skeletal surveys and MRIs. People and do those things to start with instead of yeah. taking and the I history. I think that's wrong. I it's think wrong. You need, to sit down, you need to sit down and talk to people and you can make a diagnosis on a physical exam and a history 90% of the time. Thank you, Jim. Watertown, is fibromyalgia connected to arthritis? Fibromyalgia is a description for a pain syndrome. And this particular pain syndrome has certain tender points. And there's other things, you can get headaches and you can get sleep disturbances and things like that. But it's really a pain management thing. It's not, you know, there's a lot of debate about this and you know, you, you get people to argue with me that it's a real disease or not a real disease, but it's, everybody agrees it's a pain syndrome. And so it's gotta be approached, approached like a pain syndrome. Having taken care of or seen people, I don't take care of people with fibromyalgia much anymore. I send them to the pain people to, to do their thing. But uh, we make the diagnosis. And um, it's, not, it's, it's not a destructive disease, it's a condition, and it's pain. And there's, they suffer, and it limits Absolutely. their ability, but yeah. I think the treatment is, is walking. It's, it's as much activity well, as you can get you them know, to go. Uh, you know, exercise can help a little bit, but here, you know, I'll tell you, the, the, just one little aside on exercise and fibromyalgia. Yeah. Exercise can be very helpful, but if, if it's gonna be successful, it's got to start low and go slow. So if somebody has fibromyalgia and you send them down to the pool to swim laps tomorrow, they're gonna to be miserable the next day. You gotta, really okay? you got to, you know, I tell people to start embarrassingly low on what they're doing. I'm gonna go walk to the mailbox and back three times this week, and then I'm gonna walk about 100 feet past the mailbox, and, and, and I'm, you know, you know, I got, I got weeks and months and years to work on this, okay? Yeah. I don't need to get all that, you know, go very, very slow, but it's consistency and it's the slow buildup. That will help you the most. Bingo. Fibromyalgia rheumatica. Not such a thing, okay? Two things are being com confused there. Fibromyalgia, we just talked about. Polymyalgia rheumatica. Okay. Polymyalgia what, rheumatica. Really quickly, what is that? Polymyalgia rheumatica is a, is a uh, inflammatory condition that can affect muscles and joints but not in a destructive way, and generally in people that are 60 and over. So we do see very few people younger than 60 with this condition. But the, the thing is that a lot of times they've had some aches and pains for a lot of years, and they think it's their same old, gee, I'm getting old, I'm 75 years old, and I'm just, and what they're having is this profound muscle aching. And, and one of the key things is the muscle stiffness in the morning. I mean, I have people come in and their spouse has to pull them out of bed in the morning because they're so stiff they can't get out of bed because their muscles are so sore. And the good news? You can treat it. And there's good treatment for it. So talk to them, get the Cedrate. Cedrate, uh, you need a little bit of steroid. Sometimes you gotta use a little something else with that. But I mean, and, it's, and then the other thing is there are some profound complications in severe cases where you can get inflammation in the arteries and get what's called temporal arteritis and stroke syndromes and lose vision and things. And you don't want any of that stuff. See your doctor. Bone steel. Plantar fibroma, lumps on the bottom of feet, what can I do? Well, the lumps, you know, you can get these little fibromas and neuromas and they're just little bumps and if they get next to a nerve or something like that, then they can wreak all kinds of havoc and cause pain and there's Morton's right. neuroma where it'll give you numb, uh, painful toes and yeah. those kinds of things. And a lot of the stuff, sometimes they gotta go in and take the neuromas out. Sometimes they can inject the neuromas. Sometimes uh, you can do some stretching exercises. Sometimes anti-inflammatories, it just really depends on where they are and what they are. Uh, Cavour, South Dakota, vitamins for arthritis, any that she can take. And what about vitamin supplements? Any? You know, we talked about, and it's not a vitamin, but we talked about glucosamine for osteoarthritis, yeah. and that's, that's, that is not a cure-all. Vitamin but that D. Is, you know, but vitamin D, um, you know, because of where we live and our latitude, you know, we're all a little bit short on vitamin D. Don't have to be crazy, but you need to take some vitamin D probably uh, if you're not getting much sun, sunshine especially. So that's good for your bones. That keeps those strong. Otherwise, there's really not a specific vitamin that I can say, gee, if you have this, take that vitamin and all will be. Now, we use things like folic acid yeah. when we give people methotrexate because one of the things with methotrexate is it interferes with this B vitamin right. called folic acid, and so we have to give you a little extra so right. we don't. But, but you don't but suggest it's not, otherwise. Yeah. Unless you're pr potentially pregnant. Oh, before, another that's story. A, that's different. That's, that's not an autoimmune disease. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's another cause. <laughs> Westington Springs, spinal stenosis, what can be done? Okay, spinal stenosis basically means that you've got a constriction on your spinal cord or on the nerves coming yep. down in the lower part of your spinal Happens cord. When you get old. And when you start to move around, those nerves are trying to move and they get pinched in there and all of a sudden your leg goes numb or it gets painful or Surgery? S surgery, sometimes an injection will, will, will resolve the problem. At other times you gotta go in there and open that up though. And okay. that's surgery. All right. 
Pipestone, Minnesota has osteoarthritis, is a diabetic, takes calcium already, but is there something else he should be taking? Hard time bending his hands, her hands. You know, the, um, again, don't be too crazy on the calcium, okay? If I've you, heard some you know, warnings I mean, about calcium. The thing is that you can take too much calcium, and too, and too much calcium can stiffen you up and do some things. If you're getting, you know, I, here's, here's a quick rule of thumb. A balanced diet without any dairy products is about three to 350 milligrams of calcium. And each serving of a dairy product is another 250 to 300. And so if you have a balanced diet and you're eating two or three dairy products a day that's of some kind, yogurt, ice cream, cheese, an ounce of cheese, whatever, that's it. You don't have to take any calcium. You got, you're up around 1,000, 1,200 milligrams. You don't need to. So if you're taking another 1,200 on top of that, and especially in a diabetic, I wouldn't do that. Take your 2,000 of vitamin D and, and, and uh, eat, and, eat and, right. and eat your calcium. Sioux Falls, the caller has, we gotta go fast. The caller yeah. has sore knees, she's a, a cleaning lady, she's cleaning, is that a good exercise? Oh man, um, you know, it's, it's a good exercise, okay, but if it's making you hurt and you can't do it, then you gotta figure out something. Put the pads on your knees, yeah, put, and you wear gotta, pads you know, on your yeah. knees. I don't, don't have do a good something. answer you gotta, either. You know, I don't, you know, that's, <laughs> we need more information to help. Westington out. Springs, name and spelling of medication for the feet. Well, they're, they're topical. The topical cream is? Well, they're, they're diclofenac. 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 Volterin is the brand. Volterin is a brand name. Brand name. Diclofenac. Topical. Right. Viewer has an inflamed nerve of the fourth vertebrae down to the hip and groin. Takes an inflammatory and aqua therapy. Please explain process of an inflamed nerve. It's just because it's becoming irritated. And if, if you talk to the spine surgeons and there's a, there's a, a bone spur there and the, and the nerve lays across it, they can actually see the inflammation along that nerve there. And sometimes if you can, if you can do those things, that's the way to beat it. Other times they gotta go in there and they just gotta trim all that bone away to free up that nerve again. Kieran, anything for carpal tunnel outside of surgery? Carpal tunnel, the important thing to ask is why. So if somebody says, oh, I think you've got carpal tunnel, the question you ask your doctor is, why is that? Because there are a lot of things like hypothyroid or early hypothyroid, rheumatoid arthritis, other kinds of infiltrative diseases, pregnancy, pregnancy Iron trauma, repeated use, repeated can, cause, use. Can, you, can cause carpal tunnel symptoms, and you have to figure that out. So you shouldn't just go, oh, I got carpal tunnel, I got to go Get to the surgery. surgery. And arch, I mean, a, a, a wrist splint at night. Splint at night, you know, anti-inflammatories, all that stuff. Quickly, Sioux Falls, moderate degenerative joint, uh, knee pain, will compress, compression sleeves, any medications help, and should she stop jogging? Uh, no, that's, that's moderate to 30 seconds. Too, co too complicated to try to answer We're that. We're running out of time. Yeah. Gout, 300 milligrams, seems to affect kidneys. Can I take a lesser amount of allopurinol? Yeah, that's the problem with allopurinol, is if you've got any kind of kidney problems, allopurinol becomes toxic, and that's why you know, there are other, the probenicid is one of the other medicines doesn't work if kidneys aren't working, so Euloric is the other one that we use, that new one, to, so. 10 seconds, polymyalgia, rheumatica, which joints specifically attack? It's, you know, the, it's around the shoulders, but it's more in the muscles, okay? okay the so muscles, muscles are what you want to think about. Shoulder. The muscles, the, the pectoral or the shoulder region. All right, we'll be back right after this. Chug a lug, chug a lug. I make you want to hide a hidey ho. Getting checked for colon cancer ain't all that tough. A simple stool test may be all you need, but even drinking all that stuff for colonoscopy is nothing when the odds of getting the second most deadly cancer is 1 in 20. An easy at-home fit test or colonoscopy. Get screened, South Dakota. <clears throat> what is inflammation? New ways to turn off inflammation have revolutionized the treatment of arthritis and other illnesses, which begs the question. Coming from the Latin word, into the flame, like what bonfire sitters observe the moth doing on a summer night, inflammation is a natural phenomenon that can be harmful and almost evil. But there is much more to this story. During the summers of my first four years of medical school, I was honored to spend time with the doctors of the Bartron Clinic in Watertown, where they generously provided an educational experience for me. I realize now, at that level of training, how little help I was to any of them, but how much help their wisdom would eventually be to me. One highlight on inflammation and the history of medicine came from pediatrician Dr. Eberhard Heinrichs, 
while we were examining a young child with acute arthritis, he pointed out on her hands the four physical findings famously described by Celsus, a Roman who lived at the time of Jesus. These are the cardinal signs of inflammation, rubor, redness, tumor, swelling, calor, heat, and dolor, pain, he said. A red, swollen, hot, and painful joint is not the only medical condition of inflammation. I, I saw those Watertown summers. There were abscesses, appendicitis, tonsillitis, meningitis, sinusitis, all indicating benefits of the inflammatory response where invading infections were fought off by the body's white cell warriors. Also beneficial, we have recently learned that muscle growth comes as a result of a response to localized acute inflammation that follows exercise. Other new studies show that low intensity training like walking can reduce destructive chronic inflammation. All in all, our bodies are protected and even sculpted by the yin and yang of balanced and healthy inflammation. But seeing that young girl with arthritis, I realized there can be harm resulting from inflammation run amok. That summer in Watertown, I also saw patients with asthma, poison ivy, psoriasis, lupus, and rheumatoid arthritis, illnesses the result of too much inflammation. Add to this, now we've learned certain cancers grow because of inflammation. And now we have medicine that can turn off small and harmful targets of inflammation, cooling, crippling arthritis, soothing, devastating rashes, and even shrinking, growing cancers. Rubor, tumor, calor, dolor, it can be a bad and a good thing. Well, that's our show on arthritis, Jim. You came up here uh, to also be on the board of Healing Words. Healing Words is is our, uh, our uh, funding uh, source for on-call television, on-call radio, uh, homespun radio, and uh, the, the Prairie Doc essays that we send out. So it's sort of, Healing Words is, is our funding organization, and you're on our board. I want to thank you for doing that, and I want to thank you for volunteering to be on the show. Once again, like all of the doctors, come here for free, volunteer their time, to do this patient education thing. Well, and I think <clears throat> all the doctors, including you, have come here for free and do this because it, 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 it's, a, you know, it's in your heart to do the right thing and to communicate all these things. And it's really uh, a privilege for me to be on the, the, uh, the board and help uh, uh, provide some structure and funding and some things to keep a program like this going. Um, I, you know, the, it's, Many times I've gone home after doing a show, my patients come in and say, you know, my neighbor told me she saw your show and she called her doc and wondered about this or wondered about that. So we have a real benefit and, and a real connection to the people listening to this show because I think we're giving them good information. I watch your show many weeks and I, can, I learn things from the docs that are on there. And, you know, without the, the, the people that underwrite this show, this wouldn't happen. And this is really, really an important thing to continue. And so um, thank you for your volunteer time on doing this, but also a special thanks to the underwriters of this kind of, um, this kind of program. Yeah, I, I kind of thought it would be a, a good idea to say thank you to the people who make this happen. And, and of course, a lot goes to those volunteer doctors who came, come on their dime right. to all the way here from Rapid City to do this. But uh, I want to thank Avera Health Systems, Larson Manufacturing, and the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care. They're our major sponsors. The Avera is uh, who happens to em employ me, um, one of the major systems in this state. Larson Manufacturing, uh, a, a, a window manufacturer from Brookings, uh, with a wonderful benefactor to, uh, who gives to many places, particularly in Brookings, and the Foundation for Medical Care Striving for Quality. Those are the people who are the major sponsors. And then we have additional funding from Dakota Care, uh, an insurance company, Regional Health, uh, our Rapid City uh, group, Brookings Health System, Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Mark Buback, who runs that allergy group, South Dakota American uh, College of Physicians, the Swift Health Communications, and the capturing provided by Avera Brookings Health System 
and Fishback Financial. I want to thank them. I thank you so much for being on the show tonight. This brings us to the end of our show this evening. I sincerely thank our studio guest, rheumatology internist, Dr. Jim Engelbrecht, for helping to answer all the insightful questions. The wonderful questions, sorry we couldn't get to them all. When receiving an award for his work, the famous comedian Jack Benny suggested, I don't deserve this award, but I have arthritis and I don't deserve that either. <laughs> thank you and until next time, stay healthy out there, people. Funding for On Call is provided in part by Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call, starting its 11th year of opening doors for important medical information. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding provided by Dakota Care, Regional Health, the Brookings Health System, Dr. Mark Bubach with Dakota Allergy and Asthma, the South Dakota American College of Physicians, and Swiftel Communications. Closed captioning for On Call is provided by the generous support of Avera, the Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation.